Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the Advanced Practitioner Series. My name is Patrick Shepard. Uh, we're very pleased to be joined today by a special guest, uh, Stuart Bender from the United States Department of Agriculture. Uh, Stuart serves as the designated agency ethics official over at USDA. And today we're going to be discussing uh, the intersection of the post-employment regulations uh, and the bar rules. So uh, welcome, Stuart. Thanks very much for joining Thank us. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Stuart. He's been a, a member of the ethics community for many years uh, and is, is very well qualified to speak on this topic and we're very grateful that uh, he could join us. Um, so we do have just a couple of administrative remarks before we get started. I just want to remind everyone that we do hold the Advanced Practitioner Series on the third Thursday of each month and we will be back here on the third Thursday of October for the first AP series of the fiscal year. We'd also like to thank everyone for continuing to register. Uh, not only do you help us in uh, registering on the Max community uh, by allowing us an opportunity to receive your feedback, uh, you also allow yourselves to be counted so that we can uh, sort of demonstrate the, uh, the usefulness uh, that you find in these presentations. So we, we are grateful that you continue to register and encourage you to continue to do so. We'd also like to remind everyone of our fundamental series, which takes place on the second Thursday of each month, where we talk about topics uh, that are of interest uh, to less experienced ethics officials, sort of the fundaments of the ethics practice. Just a few uh, logistical matters before we turn it over and get into the slides. Uh, we will be having a Q&A, and uh, that'll be at the end. If you have something that needs clarified and you're on the Hangout, you can use the question and answer app in the bottom right-hand side mm -hmm. of your screen, and I'll be monitoring that throughout, and we'll be opening the phones up for questions at, uh, at the end of the presentation. Uh, so with that, Stuart, shall we get into the deck? Let's do that. Excellent. I'll bring those up in just a second here. Wonderful. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank Patrick, and I want to thank the Office of Government Ethics for inviting me here today. I also want to thank um, my department, the Department of Agriculture's leadership. Uh, they have been a tremendous support to me personally, as well as to the uh, Office of Ethics. And I also want to shout out and thank the uh, team at the Office of Ethics. Uh, I am blessed with the Office of Ethics having a wonderful team. And they're so great on Sunday evenings. I look forward to coming to work because I get to work with the, probably one of the best teams in the whole federal government. So I want to say thank you to all of them for their hard work. Um, so today we're going to talk about how to survive the post-employment rules, a guide for attorneys. And what we're going to do is analyze the federal ethics rules and the professional rules of post-employment rules for attorneys by their state bar. Uh, that is an overlay that can be very confusing. And I drafted this presentation with two audiences in mind. The first audience is for the ethics advisor so that they can advise their clients who are federal attorneys. The second audience is for federal attorneys themselves. And I am mindful of the fact that attorneys are very busy. They like things uh, simplified. And so this will probably be helpful to both audiences. So that's great. It's a tool in the toolbox of our ethics officials if they'd yes. like to just share this presentation with uh, folks who might be affected by these rules. Absolutely. So this is the type of thing you can use to educate yourself and educate your clients. Um, delighted to do that. And for those people who are in small agencies where the DAO is the general counsel, there's also the postmaster general and 515 other jobs, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, there's my contact information um, coming up. Uh, so I'm the director of the Office of Ethics as well as being the DAO for USDA. And if you're at a small agency and have a lot of attorneys, feel free to reach out to us and possibly I could do a presentation like this for your group uh, in your agency if you request. So um, let's get right to it. So the first thing I wanna start off with because I am an attorney is a disclaimer. And the disclaimer is that this is focusing on the federal ethics rules, but also we'll be talking about the bar rules that are promulgated by the American Bar Association. The American Bar Association set model rules of professional conduct, which I'll be referring to as the model rules. And that is gonna be um, an area where I really need to tell you, and you need to tell your clients, that there are 50 different states and everyone has a bar that has, while they use the ABA model rules as a basis, and while that's their starting point, uh, they all look at the rules slightly differently. So the rules in every state are going to be slightly different. And so the second bullet on the disclaimer slide says, 
that for individual state bar rules, attorneys should always comply with the specific rules of the state bars for the jurisdictions in which they are licensed. So if you have somebody who's an attorney in two different states, they have to check with the state bar for both states. Um, and state bar counsel are available in virtually every state to answer attorneys' questions. So that's a really good teaching point. In fact, that second bullet, uh, you can take that, you can actually crib that and put that into your post-employment letter. So if you're doing a post-employment letter for an attorney, you can literally take those words and post them in that second bullet to alert the attorney that they really do need to talk to their bar counsel. It's a good time to remind folks that if uh, you'd like to pull up the slide deck, it is available on the Mac site. Uh, so if you're watching on the Hangout, you say, I'd really like to be able to cut and paste from this deck, uh, you can find that on the page where you registered. Great, thanks for that point. Uh, next slide. So first, let's get into 18 U.S.C. 208, the conflict of interest rules for when somebody is a federal employee and they're looking to leave, they're looking to leave government. Um, the rule in brief here is that while you're a federal employee, the conflict of interest statute requires you to immediately stop working to recuse yourself on any official government matter that could have an effect upon a potential employer with which you are seeking future employment. And this requirement to disqualify yourself or recuse applies to all employees, to career employees as well as to non-career employees. And the most important thing about it is that it's a criminal statute. So. And I think that's a really important training point when we're talking to our employees is that uh, you want to seek advice from us, not when you're just about to walk out the door, but uh, before you even begin the job search. Exactly. That's exactly right. In fact, I will use when they come to me for their job search to say to them, there's 18 U.S.C. 208, the conflict of interest rules. But let's talk briefly about the post-employment rules in 18 U.S.C. Section 207, because you don't want to accept a job that you may not be able to do if it involves 100% representing back to your agency and you're a career SESer, for example. That's exactly right. And that's something we found uh, employers have become uh, sensitive to as well. And they, they sort of ask for the advice before extending the formal offer sometimes. Exactly. So here's the things we know about the post-employment rules. They arise as soon as you leave federal government. They're complex. And they're in addition to the rules of professional responsibility if you are an attorney and again, you have to look at your, your own state bar. And if you're admitted to several state bars, you have to look at those. And if you're practicing in other states, you have to look at their state bars as well. But first, let's start out with a story. I actually will have four stories in this presentation. This is the first of four. And each of them has sort of a, a lesson to it. So let's go to the first one. And that is a picture of Ken Kaiser. And click to the next one. I'm going to bring up the data about him so you have it all there so ken kaiser was an fbi agent he was what is called an a special agent in charge or an sac a sac and being the special agent in charge in a major city like boston is a very prestigious part of any fbi agent's career uh he was also an assistant director of the fbi from 2006 to 2009 and he retired from the fbi on july 3rd of 2009 couple things about uh, Ken Kaiser. He worked for the FBI for 27 years, so he literally worked his way up. His father had been an FBI agent, so uh, FBI was in his family tradition. And after he retired, he went to work for a private firm called Locate Plus as the director of government sales. And 17 days after his retirement, and one point I'll make is whenever, whenever you see information on my slides that are bolded, it means that they're significant. So 17 days after retirement, so right after he retired, he began contacting several FBI employees by email, phone, and in person regarding an ongoing FBI investigation of his current employer, Locate Plus. Um, the problem here is that he was a um, former SES. He was a senior executive. So he had a one-year cooling off period under 18 USC 207C. Um, he didn't waste much time in violating that. He violated 17 days after retirement. And then during that year, throughout that year after his retirement, he made numerous contacts to the FBI about buying services from his new employer. And usually you see people, they violate the rule, they'll violate it by email, or they'll viol violate it by phone, or they'll vi violate it by having an in-person meeting. Um, Ken Kaiser did the trifecta. He violated all three. Um, so we can go to our next slide. 
And this is a tale of two press releases. And um, let's see, we can get the second part of that. Yep. So the one of the slides, the one with the blue header, talked about when he became the special agent in charge uh, in Boston. And it talked about his illustrious career. And he did some really amazing things during his career. And in the April 18th, 2007 press release, along with the blue bubble, it talked about how he was designated as the principal federal official of the NFL Super Bowl in 2005, which meant he got to attend the Super Bowl for free uh, as a guest. I had no idea that federal employees could earn that honor. I did not know that was an honor either. Um, so the, the other press release has a title. That one is from September 12, 2013. That's the one in red. And that one has a title, Former Head of Boston FBI Charged with Violating Criminal Ethics Law. And that was talking about how he had violated 18 U.S.C. 207. He was prosecuted by the Justice Department, the same department that had employed him, and um, basically was charged with a, with, 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 with a felony. Um, those two press releases really do tell a tale of, on the one hand, somebody who had an illustrious career, really uh, prestigious career, and how uh, it can all fall apart with violating the um, post-employment rules. And even for somebody who's a law enforcement agent and a longtime law enforcement agent, uh, they can fall into the trap of not knowing the post-employment rules. It's a really good example to tell your clients because people always feel, oh, that would never happen to me. I'm smarter than that. And here you can show them a senior official who was an assistant director of the FBI, a law enforcement agent, really didn't do well with these rules, didn't really understand them as well as he could have. Next slide. So now that we've talked about that case study, let's just go through very quickly an overview of the ethics rules for leaving federal service. And that's a picture of four USDA employees heading to the hills after <laughs> leaving federal service. No, that's not really an actual photo. Um, so the first, let's talk about 18 U.S.C. 207-A1. And this is a, a restriction on all former employees. So all former employees have a permanent ban on representations. And representations, I just want to take a second to emphasize that those are communications and appearances. So that is communicating by email, in person, in meetings, even attending a meeting where you say nothing is an appearance. So even if you have somebody who says, well, I'll attend the meeting, but I won't say anything. That is still an appearance under the post-employment regulations. So I think that's an important point to emphasize because uh, sometimes our employees uh, have this misapprehension that they have to be a deciding official or a signatory in order to make a representation, but the, the bar is actually much lower. It is really much lower. And so that's a really good point to emphasize to them that representations are any communications, any appearances, if they are appearing, even if they sign their name to a document, that is an appearance because they are looking to incur favor for their client or for their agency or for their new employer by signing their name. So that it's a permanent ban or a lifetime ban on representations before executive branch agencies, all executive branch agencies. It affects representations that are made with the intent to influence an executive branch official on behalf of a third party. And that intent to influ influence could be that you want them to take an action or to not take an action. So it could be an action that they want to avoid a penalty or they're seeking a grant. Both are actions. And if you're intending to influence, mean that you're seeking to give facts or opinions or any information that would get the executive branch official, the government official, to think more favorably and act more favorably for your company or your client once you've left government. Really, any time that we're seeking a government action of any kind, we are intending to influence. So if you're asking the government to do something, uh, we're in the zone of, of intending to influence. So exactly. Uh, exactly. An another area that's not necessarily um, intuitive for employees. Right. Now, one thing to remember for 207A1, this permanent ban, is that it only applies to particular matters between specific parties. Now, clients always say, when I'm at USDA and I'm dealing with uh, senior officials, they'll say, what is a particular matter between specific parties? And that's such a term of art in the ethics world that I normally will just say contracts, grants, audits, investigations, litigations, applications or, or claims. That's 90% of the universe. 
So sometimes I don't even say particular matters involving specific parties. I'll just go through the litany of contracts, grants, audits, investigations, litigations, investigations, applications, and claims. Pretty much any time that you can have named parties. That's yes. uh, a way that I find it easy. If, if they're named parties to the matter, at least two of them, the U.S. government and someone else, then we're talking about a specific party. Exactly. No, or great. another way of thinking about it is as, as, as dance partners. If you can identify dance partners to the dance, then there's a particular matter between specific parties. And it only applies, so it only applies to these particular matters if they are the same matters that you worked on while in service, while you're in federal service. So it has to be the same matter. And that's really a key point. Uh, going on to another one of the post-employment rules, which is 18 USC 207A2. This is really a ban for supervisors or former supervisors, because it only comes into play when the supervisor leaves his or her government position. What this restriction says is that if you didn't work on the matter personally yourself, so you did not participate personally and substantially yourself, but there were people who were under your watch or people under your responsibility who you supervised and they worked on it, then you have a responsibility. And that one is really tricky. Because if you have somebody who supervises three people, that's easy. But if you have somebody who supervises 100 people or 200 people or 1,000 people, now it becomes trickier. So let's go through the rule very quickly and a few words about that. So the rule is, if you didn't work on it yourself, but it was under your responsibility, there's a two-year ban on representations back to the entire executive branch for any representations made with an intent to influence an official on behalf of a third party, if it's the same party matter that was under your responsibility, so if it's the same specific matter under your responsibility, under your supervision, in your last year of employment, even if you did not personally work on that matter. That one is a tricky one for supervisors to get. And for several folks, what I will tell them that they have a lot of people, more than 70, more than 100, more than 150 is, don't do anything without talking to our office because we can help you because you're leaving yourself way, way open because you don't know whether a matter arose in the year that you had your final employment and you might not know uh, whether it came up because it might have been so simple that it was handled at a lower level and didn't come up to you. And that is actually more relevant for people who are higher up in the food chain. So if you have people who have not just direct reports, but have several levels of people. So they have supervisors reporting to them. It is very possible that one of their supervisors, maybe a branch chief or maybe a division chief, um, is handling a matter and it doesn't even get up to the top boss because it's a simple matter and they're able to handle it, but still it comes under this one year time period in their one year of final federal employment that triggers the two year ban on their representations back to the executive branch. And I think you make a really good point there, which is that uh, at the time we're providing post-employment counseling, often the employee hasn't left and we don't have a complete set of facts. Uh, and it, it might not be possible to create a catalog of all matters that would be captured under under A2. Uh, so, so your suggestion that they come to us with uh, for advice before making any representations on behalf of the new employer so that we can determine whether or not there's a matter that was under their official responsibility uh, is a really good one because that's a question that's easier to answer. Yes. Uh, you know, is this matter one that was under your official responsibilities rather than cataloging everything that might trigger this this bar? And I tell the senior executives and the political appointees at USDA that when they leave, they should put my phone number on their speed dial or somewhere easily accessible so that they can call. And they do, and that's great. And whenever they call, I'm always so happy because they'll say, I think I know the rule, but I wanted to call you. And I'll be like, that's great, because if you do know the rule, I'm going to compliment you. And if you didn't know the rule, I'm going to be here to help you. One thing I do want to tell you about these rules now, A1 and A2, is that they permit behind the scenes work. There's a safe harbor for most of the 207 provisions that allow you, after leaving government, to work behind the scenes and not represent back. And we'll see when we talk about the ABA rules and the model rules for attorneys, there's a real distinction there. So let's go to the next slide. We do want to talk about the rule for senior employees, 18 U.S.C. 207C. This is really somebody who basically are your career CSers and those uh, political appointees who are making above, probably about GS-15, step 10. It's indexed 
uh, in the statute. Uh, 18 U.S.C. 207 C2 gives you the formula. And this year it's about 157.5. Um, if they make more than 157.5, uh, 44, that triggers it. If they make below that, it doesn't. But it gets indexed uh, with uh, whenever the, um, um, the federal pay goes up. So OGE is always very kind. At the beginning of the year in January, they'll usually give you a cheat sheet that will, they don't call it that, but they'll give you a cheat sheet that tells you when it uh, applies. So these are senior employees, and they're senior employees defined by what they are paid. So you can have a senior employee, you can have somebody who's in a senior position, but they're only paid $130,000 a year. They're not considered a senior employee under this particular statute. Um, and so that's a really important thing to know. You could have somebody who's maybe a senior person in your organization, they're treated with respect, they have a lot of responsibility, but they may only be making 140000 yeah, I think those employee categories are always tricky to navigate. You want to make sure you're looking at the right definition. And indeed, at the beginning of the year, uh, you get a slew of loose listserv messages announcing the publication of uh, OGE legal advisories where we're updating all these different categories. Uh, so, you know, I know it could be a lot, but it's good to keep an eye on those things. Right. So for career employees, they have a one year cooling off period. So if they are a senior employee. They meet the definition uh, in 18 U.S.C. 207 C2. They have a one-year cooling off period on any representations, whether it's the same party matter or a new matter, doesn't matter, it really doesn't matter, uh, back to their employing agency. So they can't contact their uh, home agency for any period of time. Uh, and for USDA, and just speaking about USDA, uh, our, uh, uh, ru the rules for us apply to the entire department. So all of the 20 different agencies in USDA, if you work for one agency, you've got this cooling off period with all 20, the, the entire department. And one thing which I, which, I'll, which I will mention quickly is that the ethics pledge for political appointees extends this to two years. Um, and again, this affects communications made with an intent to influence an agency official on behalf of a third party, and it applies broadly to any matter. So it's no longer the same matter or the same party matter, it's any matter, including policy matters. And that's an important point to know that this is so broad, it actually would include policy uh, discussions as well if they want to represent back to their home agency. Next slide. Uh, thank you. Um, so I want to talk very briefly about uh, a rule that applies to all former employees, 18 U.S.C. 207B, which is not used very much, but for some agencies it's very important. They deal with international trade or treaty negotiations. There's a one-year restriction on aiding or advising as well as representing on any Senate-ratified trade or treaty negotiations that you worked on in your former position. So there, the key thing I want to talk about is that this is one, the one part of 207 that does not give you a safe harbor. There is no safe harbor. You cannot advise your client for a year after you leave on any of these trade or treaty negotiations that you worked on. So, so unlike our the, the restrictions we've discussed already, uh, this reaches to behind the scenes participation, aiding and advising, uh, not just representation. -like exactly, people. exactly. So this one is much more than just a representation ban. This is a total and complete ban with no safe harbors. And we'll see when we get to the attorney uh, bar rules that this behind the scenes goes away. And here's one thing in the federal uh, uh, ethics rules where it goes away here. Part of the reason is because when you're dealing with trade and treaty negotiations, they're so important and you're dealing with national security that the government really wants your information to be cold before you are advising a client in, an, in the international arena. So let's talk about safe harbors quickly. We talked about them throughout. So yes, for most of the restrictions, there are behind the scenes advice that you can give to clients or private sector coworkers that's permitted. Uh, the exception is that there's no behind the scenes safe harbor for trade or treaty negotiations. And as we will see, if you are an attorney or if you're advising attorneys, for that attorney who's leaving government, that behind the scenes safe harbor is going to be severely constrained by the state bar rules. Let's go to our next slide. Speaking of federal attorneys, if you are a federal attorney, so you've mastered the post employment rules, you've got 18 USC 207 down and the implement, implementing regulations at 5 CFR part 2641. That's just one aspect. You're just, there's more. So you have to comply 
with the applicable state bar rules governing the duty of confidentiality that's owed to your former clients and for former federal employees, their employing agency and the United States government are the former clients. And uh, before we uh, move off of uh, 18 U.S.C. section 207, uh, we did have a question come in through the Hangout, and I think it's a relatively simple one that uh, might be useful to address. And, and the question is concerning 18 U.S.C. 207A1, what constitutes a matter? Must it have been litigated? What about an investigation that never becomes a filed complaint? Uh, does contributing to a rulemaking count? Uh, so we're, we're getting to that, that hairy question of what is a particular matter involving specific parties. And I think uh, your slide here is very responsive. Uh, we have an extensive definition in 5 CFR 2641 uh, of specific party matter. And that's probably the most important definition in that implementing regulation. So I'd encourage you to take a look at that. But as a general matter, uh, any time, as you mentioned, that we can name the dance parties, uh, we have a specific party matter. And the question we're asking with 207A1 is whether that's the same matter that the employee is representing uh, back uh, in regard to. Uh, and then with respect to rulemakings, generally speaking, your rulemakings are going to be particular matters of general applicability, so not specific party matters. Uh, there are some exceptions to that with things like negotiated rulemakings uh, where it might be a little close to the line. But again, I'd encourage you to take a look at uh, 5 CFR uh, Part 2641 uh, for that definition. And if you have specific questions, OG is always happy to help. And I agree with Patrick's definition. He, uh, it, It's a really good uh, question that you asked. You asked about uh, an investigation that started but didn't go anywhere. That's, I would say that's still a particular matter involving specific parties. Absolutely. Um, Whether so, that would ever be the same particular matter after you left right. is, is a more complicated question. Right. And the matter about litigation, litigation is always a particular matter. Contracts are always a particular matter. Grants are always a particular matter. Loans are always a particular matter. The question you asked about rulemaking, I agree, again, uh, wholeheartedly with, with Patrick. Um, he gave the A-plus answer, in case his boss is listening. Always um, listening. Okay. Um, he gave the A-plus answer in that rulemaking generally, if it is broad rulemaking, it is not a particular matter involving specific parties. However, if it's rulemaking that's focused, focused on just a limited number of parties, then it could be a party matter. And let me give you an example. Let's say there's a regulation that EPA is promulgating on auto fuel emissions. That, you know, every car ever made had to deal with certain carbon monoxide emissions. That would be broad rulemaking. It would cover every car manufacturer. Let's say there was a regulation, a different regulation, that only applied to American automobile manufacturers. Well, then there's only about three of them. And then we have, uh, yes, yeah, so we'd be in the, the particular matter for 208 of uh, general applicability. Uh, and then if that was a negotiated rulemaking where I have parties, uh, then we would be in a specific party matter potentially. Right. Uh, so with rulemakings, I think that the takeaway is uh, generally, they're going to be, uh, they're not going to be specific party matters, but in those very limited cases where you might have a negotiated one, uh, you probably want to check in. Right. And I would tell you, talk to your ethics officer or talk to your OG desk officer, um, because you definitely want to make sure you're on the right track on that. That's a really good question. Whoever asked the question, thank you. Uh, I don't get paid if you guys don't ask questions, so thank you for that question. Let's go, let's go on to our next slide. Excellent. So we're going to move into the ABA model rules, and again, Every state is different. So I want to start with rule 1.6, which is the client lawyer relationship. And as an overarching requirement of confidentiality. And it's important to realize that the post-employment rules we just talked about, the, the 18 USC 207 rules, deal with the revolving door. The, the ABA rules for attorneys deal with the fact that lawyers have a relationship with their client and that relationship imposes duties of loyalty, trust, and confidentiality. And Rule 1.6 speaks to that. And it says, a lawyer shall not reveal information related to the representation of a client unless the client gives informed consent. So the lawyer would have to go back to the client and say, I want to reveal this secret or this information you revealed to me. Are you okay? And the lawyer would have to give in, uh, a full use of what the context of the use would be so the client doesn't just give consent but gives informed consent and informed consent means the client knows the full context of what the attorney will use that information for the other part of that is that a lawyer is now required to make reasonable efforts to prevent the inadvertent or unauthorized disclosure of or unauthorized access to 
information relating to the representation of a client. This one's important because it's saying you don't have, even have to say anything. You just have to make reasonable efforts here. So you can't reveal. So the first part is you cannot reveal. The second part is you have to go even further and make sure you have papers lying around or you have files or you have a, uh, something on your computer. You have to have sufficient safeguards to prevent an inadvertent disclosure. That is a high bar. And that's something that's really important that lawyers know. It's uh, you can violate the rule with your lips by talking, but you can also uh, violate it if you don't take reasonable efforts. And uh, reasonable efforts are determined by the state bar. So let's go to the next slide. In addition to rule 1.6 is rule 1.7, which talks about conflicts of interest with current clients. So now we're dealing with a lawyer who's left federal service. They're working either for a law firm or for a company or for a nonprofit or for whatever organization. And they are now representing that, that client. They have under rule 1.7, a, a duty to that current client. And the rule says that a lawyer shall not represent a client. So you can't represent a client if the representation involves a concurrent conflict of interest. And a, a concurrent conflict of interest exists if, and this is the definition of it, it exists if representing one client will be directly adverse to another client. That's why in divorce proceedings, you don't have one attorney usually represent both the husband and wife or both of the spouses. You'll have two attorneys, one representing one spouse, one representing the other spouse. Um, so you never want to have a, a situation where one client represents directly adverse to another client, or if there's a significant risk that the representation of the client will be materially limited by the lawyer's responsibilities to a former client of the lawyer. So what this is saying is if you are a lawyer and you are working for a client, you have to be careful that you can't get yourself into a situation where the risk is that your representation will be materially limited, will be severely limited by your responsibilities that you owe, your duty you owe to the former client. And again, in a federal employee, the former client is the federal government and their agency they work for. Let's go to rule 1.9. Rule 1.9 is also very important. And this is the duties to former clients. And as you can see, the, the ABA model rules have a lot of overlapping rules dealing with this duty of loyalty because it's really talking about the relationship and protecting the relationship because clients reveal things to their lawyers uh, very openly and very candidly and you want to preserve that candor that clients have with their attorneys. So rule 1.9a says that a lawyer who has represented or I'm sorry, a lawyer who has formally represented a client in a matter shall not there, thereafter represent another person in the same or a substantially related matter. Now notice hear the difference. When we were talking about 18 U.S.C. 207, we were looking at the same matter. The same matter, and that's usually the, the key question that we have to right. ask. And so, is, in other words, the same matter would be an identical matter. Right. Here, the test is much broader. It's the same or a substantially related matter. So this is a much broader test because if you're talking about litigation or you're talking about contract matters, you need to look in terms of litigation. Is there ancillary or pendant litigation? Or are there other things where it could be not the same, but substantially related? And that is where I tell people the best advice is to call your state bar counsel. Yep. Uh, because you really want to be talking to the state bar counsel in every jurisdiction you're admitted to and you're going to be practicing in because the definitions change depending on the state. So there's one really key thing to be aware of. Uh, so continuing with that, so the same or substantially related matter in which that person's interests are materially adverse to the interests of the former client unless the former client gives informed consent confirmed in writing. Again, clients can always give written consent once they are informed fully. So this is uh, sort of more specific to that that switching sides, sort of explicit about the, the prohibition on switching sides. Uh, a sort of conceptually similar, but uh, importantly different in the, the breadth uh, from the 207 rules. Yes, this is much broader. So this is one area where if you're if you're advising people and you're just doing a 207 analysis and you're saying it's the same matter, it has to be the same matter, and they don't realize there's this new or this, this ABA, same or substantially related matter, which may be new to them, right? but has been in law for a while, 
they're going to be at jeopardy. So I always tell people if they're lawyers, um, talk to your state bar. Um, let's go to the next slide. I want to spend a little bit more time. So here I've given you a definition of uh, a substantially related matter. And it's an interesting definition. I'm going to ask if anybody here understands it. It's actually from the DC bar. So I've actually given you the citation so you can look for it. I want this to be a very user-friendly presentation. So uh, you have the definition. I've highlighted the parts I think are, are really interesting. And I've given you the site. It's from Rule 1.9, Comment 3. And it says, an organizational client, such as the government, general knowledge of the client's policies and practices ordinarily will not preclude a subsequent representation. So knowledge of your agency's policies and practices. In other words, if you know your agency's playbook, you know how they operate, that's not going to preclude your representation. On the other hand, if you have knowledge of specific facts gained in a prior representation that are relevant to the matter in question, that will preclude your representation. And that is so fact specific that you always want to be sure that you're checking with bar counsel. Now, that's that's very uh, that's very complicated because we're really just looking for an overlap in in the the specific facts between two uh, maybe separate matters. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, I can see the peril there. And the case law is really all over the place. Uh, some of the case law looks to see is it identical an identical matter, and some of it the judges will actually parse out and to see what knowledge you know would have been gained right. and would that knowledge that was gained. Uh, in government service be now relevant here in the, the new representation. So uh, I give you the DC bar rules, I give you the citation there and exactly where to find that uh, for those people who are gonna be practicing in the District of Columbia, which is just one of many different jurisdictions. Um, one thing I do wanna tell you is that the key thing to take away from this is that if there is knowledge of specific facts, that will preclude your representation very likely. So if you're an attorney and you have specific knowledge of specific facts gained in your government job, you're probably not going to be able to represent that client even behind the scenes under the ABA rules. Moving on. So um, 1.9 is a workhorse rule. It has many different parts to it. Uh, part C talks about two things that are really interesting. So it says that a lawyer who has formally represented a client in a matter shall not thereafter use or reveal the information. And that's really interesting. So there's a restriction on your use of the information as well as your revealing the information. So if you're a lawyer and you're writing a pleading, you're writing a brief to the court, you can't use the information relating to your prior representation to disadvantage your former client, except as the rules would permit. That's really dicey, and that's one area where you, people have to be very, very careful. For those people going to very large firms, large firms usually have an ethics committee that really thoroughly scrubs that. For people who are in smaller firms, uh, they will have it sometimes. Every firm is different, but it's just a really important thing to know that 109C precludes your use as well as revealing the information. So that's two different tests that again are very different than 207. That's right, and I think uh, you know we see this in other parts of the ethics rules as well, where uh, you know the the prohibitions on revealing information that's confidential or otherwise uh, protected uh, seems to be straightforward for folks. But the idea of using it uh, is is a different matter that's sometimes less intuitive. So that's an important point to keep in mind. So let's go to the next slide. So this is probably the most important of the ABA model rules, and you really get the sense going through these rules that the ABA really wants to make sure that if you're an attorney, you are keeping those confidences, those attorney-client privileges, you are keeping them sacred, and you are you are properly withholding information when, where you need to. Rule 1.11 is generally the rule that deals with special conflicts of interest for former and current government officials and employees. So this is the one that's going to deal with, if you're a federal attorney, you want to look at this rule, Rule 1.11, um, and the thing that's really interesting here is that rule 1.11 in the ABA model rules at the for, for, forefront uh, incorporates rule 1.9C. That, that use or reveal ban is now incorporated by reference in rule 1.11. And it goes on to say, you shall not otherwise represent a client in connection with a matter 
So this is basically saying you can't otherwise represent that client in connection with a matter in which you participated personally and substantially as a government official, unless the government agency gives its informed consent in writing to that representation. This is a very strange, so, so basically this is saying no safe harbor of working behind the scenes. And that's really the key critical point here, which is that the ABA rules and the bar rules really curtail and drastically limit that safe harbor. And um, before we move on to the next slide, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, the DC bar because we're, we're here in the District of Columbia. Um, AB, um, so model rule 111A prohibits former government attorneys from representing a client in a matter in which the attorney participated in a substantial way for the government, even when the lawyer's subsequent representation would not be adverse to the government. So it's no defense if the if the attorney says, "Hey, this won't be you know, this won't be adverse to the government." That's not a, a, a defense unless you get the informed consent in writing of the agency. Um, so the DC Bar Rule and DC Bar Rule One Eleven A provides that a lawyer shall not accept other employment in connection to a matter which is the same or substantially related to a matter in which that lawyer participated personally and substantially as a public officer or employee. So the DC bar is very, very strict on this. And for obvious reasons, Washington DC is the seat and the capital of the federal government. And so DC has a lot of experience with government attorneys leaving and going into private practice. Um, and if you wanna look for the DC case law that deals with what is a substantially related matter, there's two leading cases I can cite you to. One is a case called Brown versus District of Columbia Board of Zoning Adjustment, and that is located at 486, 486 Atlantic 2nd, 37. It's a DC uh, 1984 case. It's an en banc decision. And in addition, there's another case, In Re Sofair, uh, and Sofair is spelled S-O-F-A-E-R, and that can be found at 728 Atlantic 2nd, 625, also a DC Court of Appeals case from 1999. And we'll be talking about the Sofair case. It has a really interesting fact pattern to it. Um, but also one thing I want to note before we leave Rule 111 is that if you have an attorney who's working for the federal government and they say, I'm leaving, but I'm not going to an attorney position, I'm going to be a consultant. That doesn't matter. The, if they're going to stay a licensed member of the state bar, these rules still apply. Um, so, for example, in D.C. and in other jurisdictions, if you're acting as a consultant where you could be deemed to represent a client, then you are going to be um, under these rules. And there's a Pennsylvania Bar Association um, state bar opinion. It's 94-132 from 1994 where they found a former government attorney was not permitted to act as the legal consulted, consultant for opposing uh, an opposing party on a case where she formally represented the government. So the rules here can be really quick. Let's get into the second of our four uh, case studies. Next slide. So let's talk about In Ray Abram Sofair. Um, Abram Sofair served at the State Department uh, in the 1980s. Um, a while ago as a legal advisor. He was actually the State Department's legal advisor. That was his position, very senior position within the State Department. And he left the State Department. And about three years after he left the State Department, a good length of time, he took part in legal activities related to, um, I'm sorry, let me backtrack. When he was at the State Department before he left, so as their legal advisor, he took part in legal activities related to the government's investigation of the 1988 bombing of Pan Am Flight 103 over Lockerbie, Scotland. That was the devastating terrorist attack where everybody on that flight died and people on Lockerbie, Scotland were killed on the ground. Uh, as the State Department's legal advisor, he was privy to information and went to meetings involving the government's investigation of that 1988 bombing of Pan Am Flight 103. The government was trying to find out who was responsible for that uh, despicable uh, act of terrorism. He leaves the government, and three years after leaving federal government, he joins a private law firm. And what happens is he, uh, his firm represents for about two weeks the government of Libya in connection with litigation arising from 
that 1988 bombing of Pan Am Flight 103. Uh, even though the representation only lasted two weeks by the law firm, and even though he had left the government three years later and he hadn't represented back to the government yet, he had violated the bar rules because it was a connected, a substantially related matter. Let's go to our next slide. This is actually the leading case. And actually, if you go to state bar commentaries, they will talk to us. This is still the leading case cited by many of the state bars on Rule 1.11. Um, the interesting thing here was that um, he was found to have violated the rule, and the D.C. State Bar gave him an informal admonition. They basically gave him a reprimand, which is a very light sentence because of the fact that the representation was only two weeks. Uh, but they noted that, uh, but he was upset with that. So he actually went to the D.C. Court of Appeals. He tried to get the informal reprimand overturned. And he appealed to the Court of Appeals. And you, I actually have given you this, the site. You actually have, for those people who like to use Google, you could actually put the 97-BG-1096 number in there, and it'll pull the case right up. But he went to the D.C. Court of Appeals and tried to say, you know, I really didn't violate the rules because it was only two weeks, and he had a variety of, of, of reasons. The D.C. court did something really interesting. What they did was they noted that Mr. Sofair elected not to solicit the views of his former agency. He did not contact anyone at his former agency, didn't contact his former ethics officer, nor did he consult with the legal ethics committee of his state bar. And they affirmed the board's conclusion that he violated the rule and upheld his reprimand. So that's a really key teaching point that, that the SOFAIR case teaches us, is that here you have an attorney who was his own client, and it's never good when an attorney is his own client or her own client, that's never a good situation, and they actually took away from his credibility that he elected, and that's their word, that he elected not to solicit the views of his former agency or the bar. So there's the teaching point there. And I think that's always a good one to make, that you know, if there's any doubt or concern, uh, you know, it's, it's better to have gotten advice than uh, to sort of fly blind. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, there's, a penalty for, um, there's a penalty for not asking timely questions. So that's another key thing, which is to tell your, um, your employees at your agency, you know, not only do you need to ask these questions, but you need to ask them in a timely fashion because that's really the only way to protect yourself. Yeah, usually that's best uh, before we make the actions. Uh, so if we, have, we want to receive prophylactic advice rather right. than after the fact. And the D.C. Court of Appeals in the SOFAIR case really emphasized uh, the importance of getting ethics advice very early on at the start, and he did not do that. Mr. SOFAIR did not do that, although he talked to lots of lawyers who were representing him afterwards uh, in trying to get the matter dismissed. It was uh, a, day, uh, a day late. Let's talk about another interesting case, a more recent one. So I gave you a case from 1999. This is now a case from 2011. It's another DC Court of Appeals case, In Re Lucille White. And the citation there is 11 Atlantic 3rd, uh, 1,226. So um, Ms. White was a DC government employee and was a supervisor overseeing the investigation of a claim. After she left government service, she became co-counsel for a claimant who was now suing in D.C. court. And what she did was she didn't do very much. She basically reviewed and edited court filings, and she attended a deposition. She was co-counsel, so she was not the lead attorney, but she was reviewing and editing uh, pleadings, making notations to make the pleadings better, and she attended a deposition where she didn't take the deposition, but she attended the deposition. In terms of legal work, that's fairly... Uh, ordinary, typical stuff that lawyers do. Next slide. Um, now here what she did, what Ms. White did, was she telephoned the D.C. Bar Ethics Council's office to inquire about engaging in this representation. That's good. I was good that she called the Bar Council. But there was a bad part to this. The bad part was the substance of the communication. When she called D.C. Bar Council, she provided only half the facts, only a partial description of the relevant facts, and she specifically admitted, I'm sorry, she, she specifically omitted and hid her involvement with that same claim 
when she was employed by the DC government. So she hid facts from the DC bar. What's interesting in that case is that the DC bar decided to suspend her license for six months and she would within six months have to show her fitness to continue practicing law. Right. She, she thought that was too harsh of a standard and so she actually went to the DC Court of Appeals and the DC Court of, the, of Appeals focusing on the fact that she didn't provide full information and that she was disingenuous with um, DC Bar Council ordered that she be permanently disbarred as an attorney wow. in the District of Columbia. So she was, not only was she six months removed, she was disbarred. She was removed from being a federal attorney, uh, being, being an attorney in the District of Columbia. And I think there's some great learning points here. You know, one for our employees, the need to disclose fully uh, all relevant facts, uh, but also when we're advising uh, employees, we wanna make sure uh, to uh, impress upon them that our advice is only as good as the facts that they've given us and that any change in the facts or any facts that they've uh, they've uh, maybe omitted or uh, failed to disclose, we, you know, we've not taken into account. Uh, so it's a good thing to note and it's also a good reason uh, to take good notes when you're advising employees so this can be memorialized uh, and you, you don't have a he said, she said situation. And that's absolutely right. So it's important, not only do, the, not, not only do our employees need to be honest with us and fully disclose all the relevant factual information uh, that's material to us, but we need to capture that so that if anybody asks, what did they tell you when, we have a record of what we were told by that government employee and at what time. Exactly so that's, right. a, that's really a, a very important practice. Let's go to our next slide. So one thing I wanna talk about briefly, Rule 111 also requires um, that when a lawyer um, is disqualified from representing under paragraph A. So in other words, if a lawyer has represented the government and they can't represent uh, a former client and they're working in a large law firm or they're working in any size law firm with other lawyers, they have to ensure that they don't get any portion of the proceeds of the legal fees. And they have to have a timely screening mechanism in place to apportion the legal fees from that representation. So they're not taking any of the profits or any of the fees generated by that representation they can't work on. And um, this becomes really important. It's very similar to the ethics rules that require this as well. Right. And uh, next slide. Um, and so to comply with model rule 111, private firms will need to implement screening mechanisms. And most of the large firms, I think all the large firms have already done that. They have very sophisticated screening mechanisms to ensure that their new lawyers are in compliance with not only the confidentiality requirements, but with that screening of fees. And I put here for you a very helpful uh, DC Bar legal ethics opinion. Um, and I've actually given you the link to it. It's actually a nice little checklist uh, to check for that lawyers can use to check for conflicts when they seek to join a new law firm. And that's really helpful for um, if you're advising a uh, federal attorney or if you are a federal attorney and you want to practice in DC, that's a really good opinion to look at. Excellent. That's a really good resource that folks can pass along to, uh, to uh, attorneys board in DC. So we've gone through three of our four case studies. Um, and now we're going to go to the fourth one. Oops, uh, and that one is called, You All Look Great in Pinstripes, the case of the former federal lawyer who forgot to call her former agency's ethics official. And this is a great one. I use this example when I advise senior officials who are attorneys who are leaving government because in this particular situation, this lawyer really tried. She didn't try above and beyond, but she did try and showed some effort in trying to comply with the rules, but not quite. And you almost can feel compassion for her. So let's go through a short summary of the case and then we'll walk through it. So the short summary is, uh, this is a former FCC supervisory attorney. So as a supervisor, uh, 18 USC 207A2 would apply. Uh, she left FCC and went to work for a large law firm and she unwittingly, unwittingly violated 18 USC 207 a2, when she signed her name to a legal document, which she submitted back to her former, former agency concerning the same party matter that was pending under her official supervision. And I've actually, this is, this is a case I found by going to the OGE um, 
advisories, the prosecution surveys. And it's listed on the OGE advisories, and I give you the citation to it there. But the prosecution surveys are really a goldmine of examples of people who, some not, not well-intentioned, but some well-intentioned, who got it wrong and were prosecuted by the Justice Department. And these are really good teaching tools to use no, absolutely. I think uh, you know this is a great resource when you're developing your annual ethics training uh, uh, or um, or your initial ethics orientation because it really brings it home that this is real and there are consequences when we uh, when we misstep. I find it particularly helpful when people will say, "Well, no attorney would be dumb enough to do this," and you say, "Well, actually, here's a couple of cases, and yes. you, this, this training provides four of them." So let's go let, let's go through it. So you have a large private sector law firm. You have the attorney who was the chief of the Common Carrier Bureau of the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC. She left the FCC and joined the law firm as a partner. Let's go to our next slide. During the attorney's time at the FCC, Company A filed an application with the FCC. So an application is in bold because that is a party matter. That's a particular matter involving specific parties. And of course, as you know, the FCC licenses uh, the airwaves. So if companies want to use the airwaves, they have to seek permission from the FCC. They want to use it to broadcast. So um, these airwaves are very valuable and these applications are very valuable. If you're a company, you want that airwave. And if you're a competitor, you might want to file a petition denying that application because you don't want your competition to have that airwave because you don't want them to, to do better than you. So in opposition, company B, a competitor, filed a petition to deny the application. So they said to the FCC, please deny that application. And the law firm responded on behalf of the applicant, company A. So the law firm here was defending company A, which had filed the application. And the application was pending under the official responsibility of the attorney prior to her departure from the FCC. So this arose uh, uh, under her responsibility and 207A2 would be implicated. Now, there's a really interesting teaching point here, which we'll go to our next slide. Thank you. Which is that while at the FCC, she properly recused herself from matters involving the application when she began negotiating for employment with the law firm. So she knew the rules about 208. We talked about 208 at the very beginning of the hour. And so she knew and she was advised that she had to uh, recuse herself from any matters dealing with this application when she began negotiating for employment with the law firm. That's excellent. So she took care of the uh, the job search portion effectively. Right. Uh, and I, I have a feeling it doesn't get better from there. No, it, it really doesn't. Um, now note in the rules, and I give you the citation to um, 2641-202, um, that official responsibility for a matter is not eliminated through self-disqualification. So the rule is basically saying, if you are responsible for a matter and you've recused, that's not gonna remove it from your official responsibility. Even if you can't work on it because you're legally disqualified and recused from working on it, it's still under your official responsibility. Not everyone gets that. That's a point that's no, very that's, subtle. That's an important point to, to sort of uh, emphasize when you're training or uh, counseling employees uh, because that's uh, not really intuitive. And what I do is I will cite to employees at USDA, I'll cite them to the regulation, but I'll also cite them to the OGE legal advisory that came out a few years earlier. Uh, it came out in 2004. It's 04X11A, uh, uh, which, uh, and I actually will quote from it. The quote is, an employee's recusal from or participation in a matter does not remove it from his or her official responsibility. And I just love that sentence because it's succinct and it really describes, and the only addition I make to that is it, the, the actual quote says his official, I change it to his or her official responsibility. But other than that, the entire wording is from OGE and it's a great sentence to use. Excellent. So let's go to our next slide. So we know that uh, she left the FCC and several months after she left, the FCC issued an order granting company A's application. They got the band wave. They were happy. Shortly afterwards, Company B, the competitor, filed a petition for reconsideration of the order. And lawyers will know exactly what that means. What it means is that the, the lovely part about our legal system is you can always 
file an appeal or a petition for reconsideration and litigation can go on for decades. And that's what company B was doing. They were filing a petition for reconsideration of the order. They were basically saying, FCC, we'd like to appeal this and want you to reconsider it. So the petition was filed since it was several months after she left. That's definitely within the two year ambit of section 207A2. Next slide. Now in her new position, serving as an attorney with the law firm, she participated in the preparation of certain pleadings. And actually you should see, I put that in bold. So she participated in preparing these pleadings. The pleadings that she worked on were in connection with the applicant's response to the petition for reconsideration. The question arose, could she sign the pleadings being submitted to her former agency? So at this point, she was working behind the scenes. Right. She was using the safeguard of she's working behind the scenes, she's participating in the preparation of the pleadings, and now the question is, could she sign the pleadings being submitted in her for, to her former agency? She raised, the, she raised the question, which was a really good move on her part. Let's see what happens next. So she's tried to be careful. Again, this is somebody you can feel bad about because they tried, they actually did try. So trying to be careful, the attorney consulted with another partner in the law firm who had knowledge of the conflict of interest laws. And that's a direct quote from OGE's description of the case. And that other partner informed, informed her that she could sign the pleadings filed with the FCC. So she went to another partner in her law firm who had some knowledge of the conflict of interest laws and law enforcement. And that person said, sure, you can sign the pleadings, no problem. So based on the advice of the other partner at the law firm, the attorney signed the pleadings on behalf of the applicant and sent them into the FCC. Let's see what happens next. Uh, she didn't contact the FCC's ethics officials for guidance. That was a big, big mistake. That's huge. Instead, she sent the pleadings under her signature to the FCC. And when the FCC received the signed pleadings, they notified her that her actions were in violation of 18 U.S.C. 207. So she tried to do some corrective action. Uh, once she was notified of the 207 problem that she had violated 18 U.S.C. Section 207, the attorney arranged for substitute signature pages to be submitted. Say, okay, here's a signature page without my signature, with another partner's signature. Is that okay? And the law firm also notified all opposing counsel about this matter and substituted the signature page. And they were hoping that would go away. Okay, sorry, we gave you the wrong signature page. We're now going to give you a signature page signed by somebody else. That takes care of it, right? No, not quite. It's a violation of a criminal statute goes over to the Justice Department. So the Justice Department investigated, and what happened was because the attorney had talked to a partner in her firm, the Justice Department not only charged the attorney with a violation of 207A2, but they charged the law firm itself under 18 U.S.C. Section 2A. And actually, this is a really important statute. It's not used very often. But tools, um, 18 U.S.C. Section 2A makes it a crime, makes it a felony to aid and abet the commission of a felony. And basically it says, if you are advising somebody and their actions result in a felony, you too have committed a felony to the same extent. So the law firm was charged with aiding and abetting a former employee's violation of 207A2. Now here you got to feel sorry for the attorney because now she's got to go to the partners in her firm and say, I got in some trouble and we're all in trouble. We're all in trouble together now. So what happened there in that situation was that there was a settlement agreement that was negotiated between the firm and the Justice Department and the firm agreed to pay a monetary settlement in exchange for dismissal. The prosecution was handled by the public integrity section of the Justice Department's criminal division the other thing that's not in the fact pattern here, but what I'm sure that has happened is the law firm would also have had a requirement to tell their malpractice insurer. Uh, they have a yeah. legal liability insurer, and they probably would have had to tell their insurance company of this mishap, and hopefully the insurance company did not raise their rates. Yeah, that could be a costly mistake. Yes, that could be very costly. That's another good thing to advise attorneys is that this is, this is the type of thing that can lead to um, repercussions in more than one area. 
It's also a good place to point out the obligation that we all have as government officials to uh, refer to the appropriate authorities uh, any uh, knowledge that we might have about a violation of Title 18. And you know, you can see that's what happened here. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And the one person who could have protected her would have been her ethics officer, but she didn't even make an attempt to um, contact her ethics uh, agencies. She, she totally neglected to call the one person who could have helped her, which would have been the FCC DAO or the FCC ethics officers who would have readily helped her. So yeah, it's not enough to just get advice. We need to get advice from the right people. And also a key thing to note is that all she did was sign a pleading, but just signing a pleading violates 18 USC 207 because that is an that is a representation. representation. Yep. So just signing it is the representation problem. Next slide, please. So what could the former FCC supervisor have done differently? And here's some ideas I wanted to give you that she could have done to help herself. And now in the age of the internet, there's a lot of resources that are available to uh, to to, to all attorneys. So the first thing the former federal attorney could have done was to contact the, the ethics office at his or her former agency. You always want to call your ethics officials, call your DAO. It's a great thing to do. Uh, I've had uh, people say to me, so can I still call you when I leave USDA? I say, absolutely. You certainly can. In fact, we're required by statute and by regulation uh, to under 2638 to answer your questions That's and right. to help you. Yeah, and I, I think you know that's an important point because sometimes uh, at the point the employee leaves, we don't have enough information to give really specific and uh, complete advice. So it's important for us to uh, be able to intervene at points in the future. Right. The other thing is to tell an attorney to contact their state's bar counsel to uh, make sure that they are observing the state bar rules. And calling bar counsel is always a good decision because you'll find out from them what their analysis is. The other thing that, that this FCC supervisor could have done was she could have researched her former agency's ethics website so she could inform herself on the issues. She could have researched the OGE website, which is always out there. She could have researched her state bar's website as well. And there are two other things she could have done, which is to contact the law firm's professional liability carrier or contact her own professional liability carrier. And whenever I tell people that, that always gets their attention. Mm -hmm. When I'm like, you know, before you do this, you might want to call your prof your professional liability insurance carrier to see what they think. Most professional liability carriers have a hotline or have a phone number where you can call and speak to somebody and they can give you advice because they don't want you violating these rules because they don't want to have to pay out That's right. for liability. They have a financial interest in keeping you uh, with, on, on the right side of the line. And I'll tell you my experience when I tell people, if you don't want to contact the firm's professional liability provider, please contact your own Yep. because they need to know because they'll be defending you. Um, that's my presentation. We'll go to the next slide. Excellent. I want to thank you all for uh, the opportunity to spend this time with you, and I'm delighted to take any questions. Excellent. And we've had a couple of questions come in over the Hangout, uh, and, and the let's take the second one first because I think it is uh, it is timely uh, to the, the the case we were just discussing. And uh, uh, the 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 question is. Uh, the uh, former employee, would, would she have violated 207A2 by merely helping prepare the pleadings with the FCC, even if she hadn't signed them? So that's a great question. If she had merely, so, and here's an interesting uh, rule. So let me answer your question. If she merely prepared the pleading and didn't sign it, she would not have violated 207's representation ban. She would have been fine because she didn't make a communication or an appearance. She would have been fine under 207 a1 and A2, she would have been fine. Um, the, the issue here, and we don't have enough facts uh, to determine, but was the matter she was working on deemed to be sub so substantially related that it would, and since it was the same matter, it probably would have, that it would have violated Rule 1.11 under the DC Bar Rules, uh. where she couldn't have even worked on it behind the scenes. And that's an answer that was not contemplated because the DC bar did not get involved because she was being investigated for, for a federal, for a federal criminal. criminal. Yep. She, she was being in investigated for a felony, a much more serious matter. 
So we didn't, it didn't rise to that level. But that's another point, which is that if you advise your client, if you advise your um, government employee, okay, you can work on it, but don't sign it. That gets into the whole matter of the state bar because right. certain state bars, such as DCs, might say, no, you represented the government on that matter. You cannot do any representation afterwards. And that was the, 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 the case with In Re Sofair. What Sofair did was he said, hey, you know, it's not exactly the same matter. Right. And they said, no, it's the same or substantially related. That's the test. Right. And he worked on it just for two weeks, made no representation, very limited amount of time, basically five, 10 working days, and got an admonition. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's, that's a good thing to keep in mind. I think that, this raises one of the, the major points of this presentation, which is, you know, sometimes we can uh, work around the potential criminal problems only to work into potential bar problems. Exactly. Yep. Uh, here's another question uh, concerning uh, 207. And the question is, is it correct that these rules do not apply to a person acting on his or her own behalf or through a sole proprietorship? Uh, so when we're talking about the representations, um, do we have a bar on self-representation or are they only representations on behalf of another? Okay, so this is a great question. So the question here is, and I want to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm phrasing it correctly. You have a, 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 a restriction under the, the, the post-employment rules on representing another, a third party. And that could be if you're a lawyer and you go to private practice in a law firm, the third party would be your law firm, would be your clients. But let's say you're a sole practitioner and you're representing a client. Well, the client is the third party. But I think what your question is saying is, can you represent yourself? I think yeah, that's you exactly can. right. Right, yes. so you can represent yourself. You can always represent yourself. So for example, if you're a, a former government employee and let's say you're a veteran, and you're not getting your VA be benefits that you uh, that you feel that you're entitled to. So even if you worked for the VA as a veteran and you leave the VA and you feel that there's a problem with the benefits you're getting from the VA, you can always represent back to the VA as a government employee and even afterwards because the only person you're representing is you are representing yourself for yourself. Right. You're not representing a third party. Right, and we're talking about a, a representations on behalf of a separate legal person. Uh, so, you know, while that usually applies to sole proprietorships, uh, it gets a little dicey when you talk about things like single member LLCs and the like. Yeah, and uh, that, that, so, so tread lightly there. Yeah, I would tell you if somebody's got a corporation and they've formed a corporation, a corporation is a legal entity under the law. So if somebody says, you know, I'm Stuart Bender and I'm an individual and I'm representing Stuart Bender myself, that's fine. But if they're saying there's a Stuart Bender corporation, which by the way, there isn't, but if they were going to create a corporation or a limited liability uh, corporation, that becomes a legal entity. And that's one situation where I'll tell you the facts are really going to be really dispositive here. It gets really granular very quickly. It does. You definitely want to talk to your agency ethics official and get the opinion in writing. And also get the full facts from the employee if you're the ethics official advising, because you know employees sometimes don't understand the important distinction between themselves uh, and a close like family or closely held company. Right, and especially if they if they form their own company, they may view the company as theirs, right, and that they're the company, but they have formed an LLC because they don't want to ever get sued and lose their house. Right, they've created a separate legal person. Right. Uh, they may not view it that way, but for our purposes, it's a very important thing. Exactly. And uh, we'll, we could also uh, open up the phone if we have any questions on the phone. Great question. So thank you to all the people who ask questions online. Thank you. We'll now begin the question and answer session on the phone. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star one, unmute your phone and record your name clearly. I will require your name to introduce the question. If you need to withdraw your question, press star two. Again, to ask a question, please press star one. We'll take a few moments for the questions to come through. Please stand by. Okay, there's a question here. You want to read yeah, I'll, I'll read the question. We've had another question come in over the Hangout uh, while we're waiting for anyone on the phone. Uh, and the question is, is it correct that agency ethics officials will not be criminally liable under 18 U.S.C. Uh, 2A if they provide unintentionally erroneous advice concerning a criminal statute, uh, sort of unlike the, the firm in our last example? So that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. And so the answer is, if you are a federal ethics official and you're doing your job and you inadvertently 
make a mistake and you tell somebody, yeah, you can do that and you overlooked a provision in the regulations or rules or you just got it wrong, you gave them the wrong advice, that employee is protected. So they've done what they should do. They have a safe harbor. Although the Justice Department and the, and the OG regulations are quick to point out that whether justice will prosecute is within the province of the Justice Department. That's right. They weigh heavily the, the receipt of advice by the employee, but right. uh, they, they don't say in all cases. As, as a practical matter, justice will always take into consideration if an employee tries to do the right thing. So if they did talk to their ethics ad advisor, they did reveal all the facts, and they did um, follow the advice scrupulously, that will weigh heavily in the analysis. Now, if you have an ethics official who made a mistake, uh, that uh, as the ethics official is not going to be prosecuted under 18 U.S.C. A2. They're not going to be seen as aiding and abetting. Th those are intentional crimes. What you're talking about is an inadvertent error. Uh, they probably will not get the best performance rating that year. Right. Uh, and it'll be reflected in their performance. There, there could, uh, performance be, there could be other consequences, but right. aiding and abetting probably isn't among them. Right. Uh, because you would have to show that it was there was a criminal intent to commit the crime. And if it's a, if it's an harmless, if, if it's not a harmless error, but if, if it's an inadvertent, unintentional error, then really the damage that's done is to one's reputation. Excellent. And do we have any other questions on the phone? We do not have any questions on the phone. Oh, well, Stuart, I'd like to thank you again for joining us. This has been uh, uh, very illuminating, and I hope everyone has found this to be helpful. And uh, this, like all our other presentations, uh, will remain as a resource on OGE's Institute for Ethics Great. and Government YouTube channel, which you can find at youtube.com slash OGE Institute. Again, thanks very much, Stuart. Thank you for having me. And uh, we, re we really here. appreciate it, and we hope you'll come back and join us uh, for, for uh, a broadcast sometime soon. I'd love to. Thank Excellent. you so much. Thanks very much, Stuart. Great. Uh, so for us at OGE, uh, we'll see you next month. Thank Take you. Care.